Good morning, everyone in Hong Kong. Uh, it's great seeing you. Um, and show and show your faces if you don't look too bad. Uh, I, I miss you, uh, many of you. Uh, it's, it's great that we have some intruders at uh, in the beginning of the of the of the panel. It, it means it means that what we are talking about is very important, right? Otherwise, nobody would would, would come to us. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for including me, um, and thanks for the generous introduction uh, by Casey. Uh, I study music. I study the music of the Uyghur, and I also keep um, a side interest in both my academic and musical endeavors. Um, in traditional Chinese music. And this paper is not directly about any of these things. Um, so what I'm trying to tackle here is the intersection between music and ideas of the Anthropocene, and particularly um, the uh, musical discourses and practices of Chinese and other non-Han uh, non peoples in China as framed in ecological discourses. Um, so this will deviate a little bit from what I initially proposed um, in my abstract. I also changed my title a little bit, uh, so it looks like this right now. So Eco Instruments, the Original Ecology Style and the Imagery of Nature in Modern Chinese Music. Um, um, and um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit, you know, very casually about a few things um, as a way of defining some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, later. Uh, only three things, very briefly. Number one, um, what I refer to as Chinese music here is a uh, kind of music that it has undergone a uh, hyper level of modernization and reformist um, uh, uh, aesthetics in much of the 20th century, particularly the second part of the 20th century. Think um, you know, those Soviet models of folklorism and reformism, uh, which you can see everywhere across the Eurasian um, continent. But the extent of reformism that you see in this form of modern Chinese music is unparalleled elsewhere in the world. Um, this is nothing traditional and, and certainly um, not traditionally um, in the music of the so-called minorities or the non-Han people in China. And I'll return to this in a little bit. And so I guess the question is, what does it mean uh, when China is building the modernist uh, musical self as it engages um, the minorities and all these ecological issues? Um, number two um, is what I call the ecology ecologization of traditional music as a kind of a musical postmodernity. Um, and of course, if that modernist reform in much of the second half of the 20th century represent a heightened state of modernism in music, then um, the return to some of these ecological concerns may be understood as a kind of a post. Um, and um, what I think is interesting is also this, this um, you know, I'm going to talk about the original ecology movements as being reframed in the representation of traditional music in the new marketplace. Um, and, and all these are conceived in the first place in relation to the minorities. Um, and so if these discourses about preservation and sustainability and all those things, what does it mean, you know, looking at all these things against the ongoing exploitation of minority cultures and resources and the dispossession, the great dispossession of minority life. And so I, in this paper, I invite you all to think about ecologization and colonialism in the same breath. And number three, of course, it's kind of the original topic that I was going to propose and going to talk about, but I didn't have time to finish writing the, the exact paper. So I'm kind of uh, uh, retreating back to something a little bit broader here. Um, exoticism. Um, we are also looking at a very similar story to what happened uh, in the 19th century uh, European romanticism. Uh, part of it relies on the nature as a source of raw material, as national origin. Think Bela Bartok, right? The Hungarian composer who had to go to the countryside to look for the pure, authenticist Hungarian uh, music um, among the Magi um, in the countryside, the real essence of national music rests in the countryside. Of course, the biggest problem right now is, um, is exotism. The music is not their own. Um, not, I'm not talk only talking about the urban uh, bourgeois versus the, the, the kind of uh, you know, rustic villages, um, but also in the case that concerns us, it is the music and the culture between the Han and the non-Han, right? And, um, and of course, I, I, I always want to return to this bigger point about what does musical uh, exoticism in modern Chinese music do? Um, 
especially how it contributed to uh, that in uh, the modern Chinese musical self in its own making. So in what follows, I'm going to present three moments or episodes of such intersection between music and ideas of the Anthropocene. Um, they're roughly in a kind of a kind of a reverse chronological order, starting with the most recent ones. Uh, but to some extent, as I said, there is also the coexistence of all these things. They somehow also overlap um, significantly and also they're you know, contemporaneous. I'm trying to make a um, better sense about their connectedness. And perhaps you can tell me about um, that as well. So let's start with the first, 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 is it not moving, first, yes, first. Um, we're gonna start with Hong Kong. The, these are all made in Hong Kong, all these uh, interesting monsters. Uh, the eco instruments. Uh, so this started as a project in the early nineteen, uh, early two thousands, um, by the Chinese Hong Kong Hong Kong Chinese Orchestra, with the creation of a series of uh, bow strings called uh, Hu Qin, or uh, you know, starting with the smaller version called uh, Hu, which is the only, really, the only traditional instrument. All these are modernist creations of you know, again, uh, the European ideals of instruments having different sizes, different registers, different ranges, uh, playing together in an orchestra. All these bow strings, again, there's only one that is really traditional. All these are new creations. Originally were mounted in the resonating chamber with a python skin, which gave a kind of a nasal timbre that is really not easy to be re reproduced by other means. And what happened, of course, um, the smaller ones are probably okay, but look at the humongous uh, monsters. Uh, these are the reformed uh, fiddle and the bass reformed fiddle. You know, you, you, you can tell that this is essentially the cello and the double bass in the orchestra. They require a humongous uh, piece of python skin. And this is, of course, not sustainable in any ways. Uh, uh, so expensive. Even if you, if you can pay it, you cannot find it. Um, you know, where to find all these uh, big snake skins. So, um, Everywhere in the world, including China, Taiwan, and, and, and Singapore, and Malaysia, um, abandoned this instrument, except for China, except for Hong Kong. Um, and I, I, there, there's not a, an easy explanation of why. But what happened is that um, they started a project to put together some synthetic materials, uh, what they call the renewable PET membranes. I'm still trying to make sense of what that means exactly, to replace the Python skin. And they're very proud of it, You know, several stages of the project and the reformer. Um, explains that it, you know, I'm, I'm reading from the last point, it has the typical tonal appeal of the Chinese Hu Qin, yet with enriched expressiveness and compelling qualities, the result is the opening up of a new dimension for Chinese music on the whole. Um, what does it sound like? Um, I um, want to play a kind of a promotional video of all these family members of this, fiddle, you know, mounted with the new PET membrane. Um, and then, of course, another way of that is, is to sh kind of show off what it can do. Uh, so this piece is uh, the very famous Rimsky-Korsakov, The Flights of the Bumblebee. Uh, you know, it's kind of an all-time favorite of those musicians who want to show off their, their techniques on their instruments. Um, maybe 30 seconds or 45 seconds of that. If I can make it work. Uh, oh, wait. Yes, I think this sound is shame. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Enough um, before. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 
Um, what is interesting is that the musicians in the orchestra hate it so much that they only use it uh, when they perform for the orchestra, which is required. And when they perform their solo concerts and they when they teach their students, they all switch back to the traditional Python scheme. And um, what is relevant to what we are talking about here is, is of course, this what I have called earlier the coexistence of this postmodernist concern for the kind of ecology um, and and being sustainable and being being uh, preservationist and at the same time playing things that are highly modernist right um, you know almost in every single sense contrasting um, with the postmodernist aesthetics second moment or episode and it is almost at the same time contemporaneous as um, I talked about a little bit earlier um, and it is the uh, we have enough of that we don't need that okay this is the original ecology movement Yuan uh, Shengtai you know a, a kind of a popular buzzword um, a kind of a discursive discursive turn in the early 20 uh, 20 uh, 20 thousand um, to early, early 2000s, um, what um, Martin Stokes has called an increasing tendency toward the presentational and the mimetic, um, which has come to seek the real essence and real presence of the other rather than a represented um, abstraction. So in other words, uh, rather than representing, representing or misrepresenting, appropriating a, a culture that is not your own, you want the original, you want the authentic. And um, this enthusiasm started in the early 2000s and you know, basically modeled after the UNESCO initiative of the intangible cultural heritage. Um, and, but the roots of this term went all the way back to the late 1980s as a liberalization of cultural expression following um, the Cultural Revolution. Um, it was also fueled by a strong scholarly appeal to savage and preserve the seemingly vanishing musical traditions um, and in much of the 20th, uh, second half of the 20th century. And many also have understood the movement as a dialectic response to excessive urbanization, reformist endeavors, and wide dissemination of foreign popular styles, which altogether have threatened the conservation of traditional styles and genres and contributed to their demise. Um, and so again, the uh, threat of homogenization and decontextualization and brought bringing about this heightened sense of cultural preservation. And so what exactly does it mean? It's really a very loose term meaning um, and celebrating a very wide range of loosely defined pre-modern and folk practices than often understood in, 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 in kind of an environmentalist frame, such as uncontaminated musical species and original natural performing habitats and all those things. So they, they use all these terms all the time. And broadly speaking, um, this term original ecology is used to designate uh, uh, styles that have previously been called folk traditional national or ethnic um, and celebrating uncontaminated um, styles you know uh, contaminate and contaminated styles and contaminated by modernity and performed in natural original habitats um, what is interesting of course is that um, the fourth point I'm, I'm, I'm doing on the powerpoint over there is that it was uh, conceived uh, in the initial stage as almost exclusively a uh, label for a lot of non-Han um, styles. So a wide range of minority singing genres were listed in the, 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 the list of all these genres, including the Mongolian Urtendu, uh, Long Song or Khume, overtone singing, uh, polyphonic singing of the Dong people called Da Ge, Grand Songs, um, among many others. Um, the Uyghur example uh, that I've written about um, is, uh, um, you know, very well known among, among the urban uh, audience in China is the music of the Dolan, which is a sub-ethnic group of the Uyghur um, in the Southwest. Um, and the soundscape, as I'm going to show you the, a video of their performance in, 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 in Beijing in 2017, it's a style that is very raw, very rustic and received very, very differently from, you know, the previous um, kind of modernist ex, uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, aesthetics that I, I just um, talk about. And uh, is um, used to symbolize the desired remnants of the primordial and contaminated authentic authenticity under the new original ecology movement. So I'm going to show a video of a performance, as I said, in 
2017 of the Dolan people, which were brought to Beijing um, to perform for a group of ac academic audience and also um, the general public as well, who became increasingly aware of their music being um, representative of this whole um, new aesthetics of original ecology um, style. So the Dolan musicians from Mekit, which is in southwestern Xinjiang, um, and they're performing in Beijing. And I have to skip a little bit uh, uh, in order to show you just the part that I want to show you. And then uh, it's, the video is a little bit long. Right, so uh, this is what the ecological sound and in, in modern uh, uh, kind of a craze for, 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 for the minority music sounds like. And to be very clear, this kind of music for much of the 20th century was framed as primitive, as backward, decried as not having any hope to enter the modern uh, kind of trajectory of um, Chinese or minority music in the, in the new time, in the new, under the new era. And now it's, it's embraced as the desire, the most you know, kind of the sexiest uh, sound for now. And finally, um, two more minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, I probably won't have time to finish everything, but um, finally, just to wrap up, um, the third um, episode, the third moment that we are talking about is... Okay, go to the next PowerPoint. Yes, um, exoticism. Um, so I was originally trying to show you a, a kind of a, a trajectory of some of the um, um, appropriated works uh, in, uh, since the 1950s. Um, to portray the minorities in the realm of the nature, in the realm of the natural habitats, um, and particularly in relation to the to the ranch, to the grassland, the steps, and all those things, and particularly surrounding um, this kind of a stereotype of a joyfulness of happiness. Um, and this is, to be clear, a very big um, repertoire of pieces, um, and um, by composers. Um, or performers in the professional circle, their interest to sample, appropriate, and uh, incorporate non-Han Chinese elements in the style um, are often uh, unproblematically assumed rather than looked upon critically. And, um, and this repertoire is also um, not trivial or marginal um, and um, is also often conceived in ethnic and racial terms um, and uh, these minority sounds, minority, minority musicians' music and their instruments are routinely heard as possessing certain primordial traits like the styles and instruments and forms and ethos that bring them closer to the nature. And a quick look over the titles, I actually prepare a few uh, slides on that. We probably won't have time to go through everything um, on this whole concept of happiness uh, uh, and this joyful Xinjiang and then the joyful everything. Um, you know, almost every ethnicity and nationality has this repertoire of having a joyful piece. Um, as you can see over there, and the 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 Taoyuan uh, steps as well. You know, almost every uh, nationalities in the north and northwest were given a piece of music about at least a piece of music about about the grass, about step, about how happy they are um, on the steps. Um, and um, 
my basic points uh, without showing you uh, the last example that I was trying to, to show um, is that these incorporation of real or imagined exotic styles into the genre of modern Chinese national music so deeply mired in reformist discourses and modernist procedures um, should um, uh, prompt us to think uh, carefully about the role of musical exoticism in uh, Chinese modern music and to the role in which how in which Chinese modern music was created um, based on some of the techniques that were imagined of those uh, minority styles. Um, this is the time I have for now, um, and I'm happy to stay over um, to hang around and for, for more questions and discussions um, in a little bit. Thank you.